Welcome to the first broadcast of the Gabriola Museum's Gabriola Stories on CKGI Radio. You'll also be able to listen to this through our website as well. Uh, we'll be talking today about a number of things uh, about the archives that we have. We'll have an interview with Ivan Bulick, and there'll be some questions that might be of interest to you. We have, we're very fortunate and delighted to have been offered this opportunity by CKGI to create a radio program about the museum on Gabriola. It's also a timely initiative for, for us. Two, 2015 marks the 20th anniversary of the founding of the Gabriola Historical and Museum Society. It's really a remarkable achievement given the fate of many small museums run entirely by volunteers on a small island with 4,000 inhabitants, and we're doing it. Everyone knows where the museum is located and can recognize its distinctive roofline. But how many have actually visited? Our new po program, Gabriola Stories, aims to provide our listeners with a glimpse into the fascinating world of Gabriola's past, present and future, and into the people who have shaped its history, while honoring one of the deepest human impulse, the impulse to record, to scratch a drawing on a rock, to write a journal, to build a cairn, to create a radio program. The museum is the record of Gabriola's history encompassing its Coast Salish First Peoples through successive waves of explorers, settlers, and most of us, incomers. Muse the museum reopens for the summer on May 17th with a new e exhibition, Gabriola Roots, The Land Provides, with a specifically commissioned video. The exhibit examines the history of farming and agriculture on the island and takes a look at some of the innovative methods Gabriolans are currently adopting to ensure sustainable farming practices and food security. This is the latest in a series of annual exhibits that have explored various aspects of Gabriola's richly textured past. For example, the Brickyard exhibit, telling of a time when the manufacturing of bricks provided a majority of island jobs. The wildly successful Hippie exhibit, Free Spirits Changing Times, and last year's Gabriola Tides, the story of Silva Bay. And this year, Again, the Gabriola roots the land provides. Places, eras, and people familiar to all, but when placed in the context of an exhibition, the seemingly commonplace acquires a power and singularity all of its own. In this first program, we will dip into the museum's archives with our archivist and volunteer director, Janet Stobbs. I will be interviewing Island Bulick, board member and co-creator of this year's exhibit. You'll find every one of our shows is going to be dealing with either something from the archives, an interview with something in regard to the museum, and there'll be questions that you can send in to us uh, to our website, and we will try and answer them for you in the following episode. So, let's get started. I'm Doug McKnight, and I'll be your host for the Gabriola Stories. In this first program, we'll dip into the museum archives with our archivist and volunteer director, Janet Stobbs. Janet, were there any First Nations settlements on Gabriola Island? Yes, there were. In the midst of time, petroglyphs were carved in the rocks of Gabriola. They could be as old as 5,000 years. So we know that the First Nations have been utilizing the natural resources for at least that long. Evidence showed that there were villages on Gabriola for at least 2,000 years, maybe even longer. The site on Gabriola was at False Narrows, which we now know as El Verano Drive. This was quite a large village, perhaps upward of 5,000 Coast Salish people prior to the arrival of the Europeans. It was a permanent all-year-round village and had a burial ground where archaeologists have recovered the remains of at least 500 people. People harvest the ocean for fish, clams and kelp. They hunted seals, sea lions, ducks and deer. Edible roots, bulbs and berries were gathered and preserved for the winter months. Once the Europeans came, the First Nations people no longer stayed all year round. There is evidence from maps from the 1850s that there was a small settlement at Degwin Bay. 
By 1839, there were only 1,000 people, and by 1876, the census showed only 223 First Nations peoples. Well, Janet, when did European settlers come to Gabriola? The first recorded contact occurred when the Spanish Navy visited Gabriola in 1791 or 1792, but there may have been earlier encounters. We think the location that they anchored could be either Descanso Bay or Twin Beaches. One great source to investigate is a shale periodical edited by Nick Doe. We still have copies at the museum. Regular contacts with Europeans did not begin until the establishment of the Hudson's Bay Company in the 1820s. Preemptions began in the 1860s, and within a short time, the land on both Gabriel and Mudge were settled. Preemption was a mean of colonists obtaining and working land. Many of the European men married First Nations women who understood the ways of this land, and it was this combination of European and First Nations people who farmed the land, raised their stock, and fished the sea. Gabriola farmers supplied fresh produce to the Nanaimo coal miners, and indeed there were many Gabriolans who worked in the mines. Uh, Janet, do you have any stories about farmers on Gabriola? I have a document that records the reminiscences of Cereal Llewellyn Williams, who spent many summers on the William Griffiths farm from the north end of Gabriola in the 1920s. William Griffith had worked in the mines. He had worked on the morning shift just prior to the explosion in May of 1887. After this disaster, like many others, he sought employment. In his case, he preempted land and Gabriola to take up farming. It sounds as if Cereal had many a happy memory of this farm. The following quote is just a small sample of what he wrote about his experiences. This story dates to 1920. We lived very simply on the Griffith farm. There was a very good well that never ran dry and which also kept butter, milk and such things cool. These were put in a bucket and suspended by a rope from a wooden structure at the top of the well. I was able to help Grandma and Grandpa by getting in wood and picking the winter apples, feeding the chickens, collecting eggs cleaning the chicken house and countless other tasks that had to be done about the farm. We didn't stray far from the farm because to get to most places we had to walk. I did that a lot, for I liked to go down to the beach, go swimming on the hot days, and wander along the skid rows picking blackberries. Kerosene lamps provided light at night. In the longer evenings we read by coal light. Grandma liked me to read to her from the Bible. School, however, resumed and brought to an end these enjoyable times. Do you have any records from newspapers or journals in the 1800s? Yes, I have three stories about farms from the Nanaimo Free Press in the 1880s. And it's said there the articles are written with kind of a wry sense of humor. This one from the October the 23rd, 1886 edition reads... Mr. Jonathan Martin of Gabriola Island sent to our office some monster specimens of red and yellow onions. They are the largest we have seen and would bring tears to the eyes of an Ontario farmer. August 17, 1887, Mr. D. Roberts of Mudge Island had laid on our table some magnificent plums. These fine specimens are but another indication of what our splendid climate combined with pro-management can produce in the shape of fruit. In a few years, importation of fruit from California will be as scarce as hailstones in July. And the last, on June the 14th, 1889, Mr. James McClay of Gabriola left at our sanctum today several giant stalks of rhubarb which he has grown on his farm on that island. The rhubarb is of the Victoria variety and three clear stalks weighed six and a half pounds. Thank you very much, Janet. You're welcome. You'll find every one of our shows is going to be dealing with either something from the archives, an interview with something in regard to the museum, and there'll be questions that you can send in to us, uh, to our website, and we will try and answer them for you in the following episode. So, let's get started. I'm Doug McKnight, and I'll be your host for the Gabriola Stories. Uh, I'd like to welcome Ivan Bulick to the uh, program right now, and he's going to be discussing with us uh, the new exhibit at the, the Gabriola Museum. Ivan, welcome. Hi, Doug. 
Uh, Ivan, why did you to choose this particular topic? Well, the um, exhibit committee, we were looking at and discussing the history of Gabriella, as we do, and looking at various topics. And uh, of course, farming is something that people are interested in. Agriculture, we all eat. Everyone's interested in food. Where does our food come from? And how do we uh, consume it? How do we produce it? So that touched on the bigger question of how do we relate to the land that we live in. So in essence, our new exhibit, The Land Provides, Gabriola Roots, really talks about the history of land use on Gabriola and, and farming, gardening, agriculture, food production is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the situation today, re-food supplies? Uh, I've heard that the fact that we've only a few days supplies in the grocery stores. <laughs> All the items are brought in from the mainland. In case of any emergency, such as earthquake, will we run out of food? Well, in British Columbia, that's that, the trend has been probably from about the nineteen late 1960s, and it accelerated right into the 1990s, where we've paved over our farmland, and we import our, our food, our fruits and veggies, uh, for example, in BC, 70% comes from California and the U.S. At the same time, our own food production has gone, has decreased by approximately 10 to 15%. So the model is we pave our farmland over and we import food. Um, I don't know how much, you know, what the uh, backup is in Vancouver Island. I've heard everything from three days to five days. Here on the island, I mean, it's very true. Most of us do not grow our own food or produce our own mm -hmm. food though that's something that certainly is changing and local farmers hope will change. Is that a big difference from what happened in the past, let's say in the 1800s? Well, in our display, we, we go back even further. Uh, it, it's interesting to note, so many of us are newcomers on Gabriel, and we think of, of the island history as being very recent. Uh, in essence, Gabriel is really a very ancient place when it comes to human occupation. Mm -hmm. Uh, we we can document human occupation here uh, for about the last 2,500 years. Uh, some estimates put that even further back, uh, up to 5,000 years. So if you compare that with other parts of the world, uh, we're, we're as old as ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. In other words, the culture and the people who have been living here have been living here for a very, very long time. And up to approximately 100 years ago, that pattern was we had a fairly substantial number of people who lived in coastal villages and were a maritime people. They fished, they uh, utilized uh, the resources of the seashores for gathering food, uh, they hunted, uh, etc., and they uh, used the forest for building materials. But most of the settlements were along the seashores, and the resources of the island were able to maintain a substantial population in a very sustainable manner. Mm. Uh, we think that the population probably uh, approached up to 5,000 people for most of the time that people lived here. Yeah. And that number has only been matched uh, in the early part of this century when our 2006 census finally topped 4,000. Mm -hmm. So the normal pattern of human uh, blind use on Gabriola really is that 5,000 year pattern of a maritime culture living on the seashore and sustain, su sustainably using the resources. Okay, will that all be represented somehow in the display that's coming out? Well, we, we hope it is, we hope we get it across. We've utilized our own archival images and others that have been donated to us uh, and loaned to us. Uh, we have some artifacts as well mm -hmm. that will hopefully tell that long story um, and uh, the video that's being done by Toby Elliott oh, will... You're making a film. Yes, there'll be a, a short video, approximately 20, 25 minutes. That will focus more on the current move towards small-scale, sustainable agriculture. We're calling it the new agrarianism, the new farming, for mm. want of a better term. But that is a move that is really being a, being explored by young farmers, by a growing generation of farmers. But you're right, we do touch on how farming has taken place, certainly in the last 150 years. Okay. Um, 
Do you require any other artifacts or photos that might help out here that our audience might be able to? Museum contribute? always welcomes artifacts, photographs, documents, letters, uh, things that people have at home that they may perhaps feel are not of great value. For example, a receipt if someone bought a farm implement or, or some supplies in the 1920s or 30s. Uh, and they may think, oh, you know, this is perhaps has little value. From a historical point of view, that may be a very important or meaningful document. So we would really encourage uh, anyone and everyone to look at what they have and to consider donating them or at least sharing them with the uh, museum and with the archives. Good, and we've had quite a few donations already, have we not? Uh, we have, uh, not as many as we'd like, of course. We always want to see more, but uh, people should uh, certainly consider um, giving us a call. Okay. And sharing their artifacts. Yeah, by all means. Okay. Um, why should people care about this topic? Well, I mean, from, a, from a basic point of view, we all eat. Mm -hmm. uh, I think more of us are much are concerned about where our food is coming from, the nature of the food, uh, the whether or not it contains pesticides just from a, a basic point of view, and uh, whether, whether it's nutritious. From an economic point of view, uh, eating locally, growing locally is something that supports our local farmers. And though agriculture really is not the main industry on the island, um, and in our display we talk about that, in fact, mm. agriculture was always a very a marginal industry large-scale commercial agriculture was never that successful on the island. And that was simply because our, our island soils are not good farmland. Very small parts mm -hmm. of the island are. But small-scale gardening, small-scale organic agriculture is really exploding right now. So people, um, I think, have a new awareness and certainly a new interest in what is happening around them and where their food is coming from. So uh, we're hoping that this display, Gabriella Roots, will really spark an interest in people to explore what is happening and to, to really see where their food is coming from and support local local farmers and mm -hmm. growers. And the land provides. Where did that title come from? What does it mean? Well, what we're trying to explore here is the relationship between uh, islanders and the land. Uh, the land provided for Many thousands of years, the land did provide sustenance, a home. Uh, it fed and clothed and housed a substantial population of people. Uh, the land was, at one point, it was preempted. So our, our second topic we could talk about is how did that change? Why, when we come to Gabriola today, are, do we not see a culture and a society similar to, say, uh, Mexico? or South America, or other parts of the world where the original inhabitants still live here. Mm -hmm. And there was a very real reason for that. There was a specific uh, process that took about 10 years, whereby the land was preempted. The provincial government, or it was the colonial government at that time, enacted in 1860 a land ordinance that allowed uh, anyone, except First Nations, to preempt to get to obtain 160 acres of land, a quarter section, uh, for the simple, um, with the simple task of simply improving that land, clearing a few trees or building a cabin. Now, through that process, the original inhabitants couldn't uh, obtain their own land, which is why today we do not really have a large population of uh, First Nations living here, and instead we have the population that does live here. So that was a very real conscious process. The people who came wanted to farm. Uh, it was was not uh, particularly successful. Um, they thought they would supply food for the mining communities in Nanaimo. Mm -hmm. um, but by the 1880s and the uh, building of the Nanaimo Esquimalt Railway, local farmers in Vancouver Island could much more easily supply the Nanaimo market. They didn't have to ferry their food across mm -hmm. or their produce and their livestock. Uh, farmers here really became ranchers and the only successful agriculture was uh, the growing of livestock and ranching. Um, so most farmers ended up 
working at the brickyard, working at the shipyard, working at the quarry, or even going to Nanaimo to work in the mines. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so farming was a high priority. It, it was, people had to try to grow their own food, but large scale commercial agricultural uh, endeavors uh, were, were few and far between here on Gabriella. Is that the case right now as well? Uh, me, yeah, it still is. There there okay. are perhaps two uh, or three large-scale uh, farmers, but when you look at the population of the island, that represents a tiny portion mm-hmm. of the island. Okay. Um, is the display more historical or more current, geared to the last 20, 30 years? Uh, I, I hope that it, it it's both. Good. I, I hope we talk about So do we. <laughs> <laughs> that we do talk about essentially how we got to the to where we are now. Why do we live the way we do? Where of the 4,045 people on Gabriola, most of us live within short walking distance or reasonable walking distance of the Gabriola Ferry on the north end mm-hmm. in uh, very tight housing subdivisions. And we buy our food from the grocery store. I mean, there are very real historical reasons why that pattern was developed. Um, and uh, we really talk about it. For example, in the 60s and 70s, uh, farmland here on the island was cheap. There was a lot, a lot of it. And uh, because of the establishment of BC ferries, electricity that came to the island at the same time, and paved roads, we had a huge influx of people who came to develop, buy the farmland and develop it for housing, mm-hmm. which is the pattern that we have today. So really when we look at the island's rural nature, the island's uh, land use uh, pattern, uh, there's been this constant uh, struggle, you could say the pendulum shifting up and down between is this going to be a rural uh farming community or is it going to be a suburban bedroom community of Nanaimo and that balance uh, swings one way or the other and there's a certain antagonism there's a certain resolution on Gabriola (laughs) and and what we're seeing today is the balance that exists now and the display is and the exhibit is trying to look at those questions and and basically see why we why we are the way we are here well what goes into putting up a display or an exhibit for the museum? Uh, well, this particular exhibit, uh, the planning for it started last September. Um, a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of meetings with people, exploration of our own resources, our own archival images and documents, uh, the serendipitous gifts that we get from mm. and donations we get from islanders who say, oh, I know about that, and or I've got this document or image or artifact you may want. And then also we share with other islands. Uh, We need to keep in mind that uh, we're one of the Gulf Islands and our history is unique, but there are some shared components that other islands have also experienced. For example, Main Island trustee Brian Mm Crumblehume has come to Gabriola, spoken at some of our forums and brought another perspective that is almost like a mirror that enables us to see, oh yeah, they're, they're facing people on Maine have gone through a similar history and are facing some of the same challenges we are. So by establishing the, or exploring and researching these exhibit, this exhibit, we've been able to both see what we do and what's unique here in Gabriel and also what we share with the larger region. So the commonality. Precisely. Across it. Yeah. Okay. Um, the final thing I'd like to ask you uh, is when do you start thinking about next year's display? We're already thinking about it. That's good. <laughs> yeah. You want to clue us in a little bit? Uh, I think we will probably wait until we've got things firmed down. We've got a number of ideas, but uh, and there are as many ideas as there are Gabriolas okay. in terms of displays and, and potential exhibits. But we've got some, some things in the, in the works, and we'll probably be announcing something closer to the fall. Oh, That'll be exciting for us all, I'm sure. Uh, is there anything that the community can provide that would make the museum better reflect what the island is? Yeah, of course, feedback. We, it's a two-way street. Uh, the museum isn't simply uh, a collection of, 
of glass top cases holding, you know, dusty sh- seashells. Well, that's uh, good. Hidden, hidden away, and and something that uh, people go to look at once and say, "Well, I've been there." We're hoping it's a living, evolving, ongoing institution that uh, reflects, as our mandate says, to tell the story of Gabriola and to reflect that. But in order to reflect that, we need to know what the stories are. Oh well, yeah, because we're all part of that story. Precisely, we all have our own stories. So, if we need, we really are asking Gabrielans and visitors and and those who who simply care about the island to come have a look at the museum, look at the exhibits, and and let us know. Does this tell a story? We 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 really do need that feedback. It's a two way street. Great. Well, thanks a lot for coming in, Ivan. Well, thank you. A lot you. of information. As we begin the final segment of our show, uh, it's one that comes from you, the audience. We, in the past, have had a number of people ask questions about the museum. And I've got Janet Stubbs with me again, and she's going to answer them for you. I'll, I'll read them, and she'll have the answers. The first question, Janet, how can I donate an item to the museum? You can contact us in several ways. Telephone the museum. Leave a message if we are closed or talk to the person on duty or access the web page. The message will be relayed to the appropriate person. So if I, I'm going to ramble here. If I want to go to the web page, uh, is there a link, an email link? You know what? I do not know. Do you think there should be? I think there should be. I think there will be then. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. The next question, is there a limit as to the size of the item? Ah, well, my predecessors told me that anything larger than a bread box has to be approved by the board. I was talking to a club a couple of months ago, and I used the bread box idea. One fellow put up his hand and said, how big is the bread box? Got a few laughs in the audience. I also accept documents, newspaper clippings, letters, postcards, books, photographs, posters, and pictures. I tend to start reading uh, letters and clippings and sometimes the papers take a while to a session and store it away. It's a great way to learn about the island and its people. I feel I have been here forever instead of just eight years. Is that a good feeling? It is. Okay, so you're really involved (laughs) in the the museum. Oh yeah, very much so. And I bet you can answer this next question too. What is the criteria for a donation? Pretty simple. It should be about Gabriola, or used on Gabriola, or made on Gabriola, like a saw that was used in logging, or an agricultural implement that has a few years of history on it. We have a wooden rake that we are not sure whether it was used to rake hay, or pulled along the ground to make grooves for planting, and it was made on Gabriola. The hippie display is full of toys and household goods used on the island in the late 60s and early 70s. We have a beautiful Victorian-type ewer and bowl set made somewhere else, but was lovingly cared for by one of the pioneer ladies. All one has to do is know the history of the item and ask. That's simple. It is simple. Very much. That's good for me. Can anyone do research in the archives? Yep. The purpose of the archives is to preserve, maintain, and make available to all. That means you don't have to be a person researching information for a seminar or a university degree. You could be someone who wants to know just a bit more about the island or find out more about your family tree or writing an article for a newspaper. The best way, again, is to phone, email, or visit our webpage. I am a volunteer, and as such, I do not have regular hours, but I shall get in touch with you as as soon as I can. Our webpage you can get through the Gabriola Historical Museum Society or www.gabriola museum. And our phone number is 250-247-9987. Thanks a lot, Janet. And for our audience, if you have any questions that you would like answered, please contact us and Janet and her crew will do the research and try to find the answers. Thanks again, Janet. You're welcome. Thank you all for being a part of this uh, inaugural podcast that the Gabriola Museum has put together for you. And don't forget that uh, you can come to the museum anytime. Actually, one thing I forgot to mention earlier was that we have some outdoor displays, so you can check those out year-round. I'd also like to mention that uh, opening day again is on May 17th. Come to see us at the market 
on Saturday and uh, the Canada Day special that's going to be happening at the museum. Now, no podcast is complete without input and volunteers, and I'd like to thank the following people for making that possible. Janet Stubbs for the information she provided on uh, the archives, Ivan Bulick for the information on The Land Provides, and behind the scenes we had uh, Elizabeth Yekeli, who wrote a lot of the script, and David Andrews as uh, the tech person, and me, I'm Doug McKnight. And we'd also like to thank Frank Moore for all the help he's given us to make this show possible. Thank you. Don't forget to tune in for the next episode. Thanks again.